Welcome back, fellow travelers, and let us continue onwards into the sea of mysteries that is nanoscience. In today's episode, we will take a look at what a nanoscientist actually encounters when they succeed in obtaining materials with building blocks only 10 times larger than an atom. It is now time to understand why nanomaterials are so starkly different from their bulk or larger sized counterparts. Here we finally make some progress in understanding the mysteries behind the strange properties behind the Lycurgus cup and Damascus steel, which we have discussed in brief on our Instagram page. We also try to understand why gold is yellow, but a solution of suspended gold nanoparticles can have colors ranging from violet to wine red, or why graphene, which is essentially only a flat sheet of carbon atoms arranged in regular repeating hexagonal pattern, is potentially 10,000 times stronger than steel and can conduct heat about 7,000 times better than metallic copper. Let's go, curious wanderers deeper and deeper still. When one deals with objects at the nano scale, one must all but forget what that material behaved like when it was still in the millimeter or micrometer size range. The two main factors that come into play now are the quantum confinement effect and the drastically altered surface to volume ratio of the atoms that make up the material. These two effects and their unique interplay is the reason that nanomaterials are sought after for their novel and enhanced properties as compared to regular materials. Let us start by understanding the meaning of the surface-to-volume ratio. In simple terms, it is a mathematical term where the surface area of an object is divided by its total volume to arrive at a mathematical quantity indicative of how much of the material that makes up the object is occluded from external interactions. Naturally, the higher this ratio, higher is the amount of the material that can interact with its environment. As an example, let us consider small cubes having an edge length of 1 cm, which gives them a surface area of 6 square centimeters, and a volume of 1 cubic centimeter, giving object A an SV ratio of 6 per centimeter. Imagine a slightly larger cube, object B, made of these smaller cubes, where its edge length is 2 cm. This means that a surface area of 24 square centimeters and a volume of 8 cubic centimeters gives object B an SV ratio of 3 per centimeter. This means that a reduced amount of the material is available to interact with any external factors. As the cube's edge length goes on increasing, the SV ratio will decline, and so will the expected interaction capability of the object. Why this phenomenon is important for nanomaterials is that if we talk about the atoms or molecules that make up nanomaterials instead of talking about little cubes, we will arrive at the same conclusion as before. This factor alone is enough to make the behavior of nanomaterials drastically different from bulk material. But it is not the only factor in play. You see, when you deal with atoms, you can't ignore their cousins, the electrons. At a size scale of only 10 times larger than an atom, we are still in the mysterious quantum realm. And when in Rome, we must do as the Romans do. In our everyday life, we have heard of objects being electrical conductors, insulators, or semiconductors, which simply tells us how easy it is for electrons to flow through certain objects. What decides the properties of these materials are their building blocks, that is the atoms they are made of. An atom is essentially made up of a central core called the nucleus, which is formed by neutral neutrons and positively charged protons. Around this core, electrons move in orbits of sequentially increasing radius. All the elements have different numbers of electrons orbiting the nucleus, which gives them all their different properties. The electrons in the outermost orbit are called valence electrons, and these primarily interact with whatever the atom comes into contact with. When an atom is given energy in any form, electrons from this valence shell jump to an imaginary level of higher energy called the conduction shell. Depending on how many electrons can enter this conduction band, a material may be classified as a conductor, a semiconductor or an insulator in decreasing order of electronic activity. When we talk about a single atom, these various electron orbits and the valence and conduction levels can be thought of as different energy levels, 
with the innermost electron orbit having the highest stability and thus being lowest on the scale and the conduction level having the lowest stability and being highest on the scale. When we talk about a number of atoms, these energy levels of many atoms seem to merge and form bands, with all energy levels of similar energy almost overlapping each other. Thus, the gap between the valence band and the conduction band, hereafter called the band gap, is the factor that decides how much energy is required to allow electrons to start moving through the material. Insulators have the highest band gap and require extreme amounts of energy to allow the flow of electrons, which may even damage the material. Conductors have the lowest band gap, which means that small amounts of energy are enough to allow the flow of electrons. Semiconductors have a band gap between those of insulators and conductors. This theory of bands makes it very easy to study the properties of bulk materials that have extremely large number of structural units, since their energy levels merge conveniently to form bands. But when we talk about nanomaterials, since there aren't enough structural units to properly merge into bands, the properties differ vastly from bulk materials. When you go top-down, the bands move away from each other, making electrical conductors into semiconductors or insulators, and when you go bottom-up, the opposite trend is observed. Since the large scalar bulk properties are confined due to the proximity of the bands as measured in the quantum realm, this is called the quantum confinement effect. Thus, the surface-to-volume ratio and quantum confinement effect together dictate the properties that any given nanomaterial will have. These are seen in some very interesting ways that completely defy common expectations. Optical properties of nanomaterials. As discussed before, the gap between the valence and conduction bands increases as we go from bulk to nano, that is, the band gap increases, and it takes more and more energy to excite an electron. As an example, let us think back to our gold solution. In the visible spectrum, that is in the Vibgear range of colors, violet has the shortest wavelength, and red has the longest wavelength. If you look at the equation on the screen, you will observe that wavelength and energy of the photon are inversely related. Therefore, a photon of the violet color will have the highest energy, and a photon of the red color will have the lowest energy. One thing we must remember is that the color that we see is the wavelength that an object reflects, while the remaining wavelengths are absorbed. Therefore, going back to the band gap theory, it is expected that when gold goes from bulk to nano, its band gap will increase. This is evident because bulk gold is yellow, which means a medium energy, and gold nanoparticle solutions have either a wine red or violet color, which clearly shows a shift from Y to V on the Vibgear scale, which shows an increase in the band gap and a consequent increase in the energy required to excite an electron. Another amazing example of this phenomenon is butterfly wings, which appear to be shimmering and multicolored due to their nanoscale structural units. Electrical and Magnetic Properties of Nanomaterials Now that we have studied the quantum confinement effect and seen its implications in everyday life, understanding the electrical and magnetic properties of nanomaterials will be easier. The band gap theory very concisely explain why metals, which are usually conductors, may become semiconductors or even insulators at the nano-size scale. However, this phenomenon can be finely tuned by doping other atoms in a nanomaterial, or by controlling its size and shape, called its morphology. This allows the band gap to be controlled and influenced, as per the need of any particular application. This strategy is frequently used in the design of modern types of solar cells, such as dye-sensitized solar cells and quantum dot-sensitized solar cells among others. The case of magnetic properties follows similar lines, but is influenced by some more complicated factors, such as change in orbital configurations of electrons, change in electron spin activity, etc. These properties also depend on the polarizability of the nanomaterial, which can be altered by doping and morphological control. Often, exotic states such as superconductivity and esoteric applications such as exploratory research can be easily accessed by unique and ingenious material design strategies. Nanomaterials have been integral to the technological boom of the new millennium, 
with their ubiquitous presence in circuit boards, display systems, high-end research aids and many many more. Physical and Chemical Properties of Nanomaterials When we talk about the physico-chemical properties of nanomaterials, we must discuss the quantum confinement effect QCE, and the surface volume ratio SVR, together. While the QCE dictates the electronic response to external stimuli, the SVR decides how many atoms or molecules are available for this interaction phenomenon. The SVR often helps in predicting the reactivity of a particular nanomaterial and is thus is very useful in the design of nanocatalysts. It can also be used to investigate whether or not a particular nanomaterial will be structurally stable and hence can predict the feasibility of a particular synthesis process. The SVR can also be used to study the porosity or orientation of nanomaterials so that their properties can be reliably predicted and corroborated after experimentation. The QCE is vital to most physical properties, such as electrical and thermal conduction, polarity and polarizability. The SVR and QCE phenomena together also dictate the density, hardness, solubility, and surface energy of the synthesized nanomaterials. In the real world, this translates to all the possible applications that a material may have, or the changes that need to be made in a material to achieve the desired properties. The properties of the nano world are as numerous as they are diverse, and yet there remains much still to be discovered. But it is only by shifting from macro to micro and micro to nano that humans have entered this era of technological progress, and it is only by exploring this sea of scientific mystery that we will be able to move even further. It's been a long journey so far, but sadly we haven't even begun to touch the tip of this iceberg that is the world of nano science. Rest assured however, for we are brave travelers, and the spark of curiosity and adventure has been ignited within us. The journey shall continue, and we shall once again fill our wide open minds with all the mysteries that this universe is yet to reveal. That is after all, the beauty of the unknown. The things we think are impossible, are nothing but dreams of the future. This is Mr. O signing off, until we meet again on the journey that we call, the Nano Odyssey. In the next episode we will study various methods used to synthesize nanoparticles. Hey I am Miss Keen. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to my channel. And for latest update hit the bell icon. Until then keep exploring.